Hey, future doctors, you're watching Medology, and today we're diving into ECGs. If you've ever stared at an EKG and thought, what am I even looking at? This video is for you. In this video, I want to teach you everything you need to know about the ECG. To do that, we're going to start from scratch and cover it step by step, from the very basics all the way to full interpretation. Once you understand the foundation, reading any ECG will become much easier, almost like second nature. First, let's ask, what exactly is an ECG? ECG stands for electrocardiogram. In simple terms, it's the electrical recording of the heart's activity. We pick up this electrical activity from the surface of the skin using leads, and the result is a series of waves that represent how the heart is working. But what are these electrical waves that we see on an ECG? To answer that, we first need to understand how heart muscle cells work. Cardiac muscle cells are connected to each other through structures called intercalated discs. And within these discs are gap junctions. These gap junctions allow electrical ions to pass directly from one cell to another. In general, the inside of a cardiac cell is more negative compared to the outside. This simply means that there are fewer positive ions inside the cell than outside. When the heart receives a signal to contract, a process called depolarization begins. Positive ions, mainly sodium, rush into the cell, making the inside of the cell more positive. This is the electrical change that triggers muscle contraction, just like we learn in cardiac physiology. But this isn't the end of the story. Those positive ions can now travel through the gap junctions into neighboring cells, triggering depolarization there as well. This process spreads very quickly, from one cell to another throughout the heart. As these electrical impulses move through the heart in a specific direction, they create a net electrical vector. And that's what we're actually measuring in an ECG, the direction and strength of the heart's electrical activity, shown as waves and impulses on the graph. In the next parts, we'll break down each of these waves and what they mean. One important thing to note is that in certain parts of the heart, the intercalated discs are highly specialized and contain a much greater number of gap junctions. This adaptation allows electrical impulses to travel much faster in these areas, forming what we call the cardiac conduction system. Histologically and anatomically, this system is made up of nodes and fibers, which are specially organized clusters of cells. These conduction system cells are different from regular cardiac muscle cells in several ways. They are smaller in size. They have little or no contractile ability. They contain specialized ion channels. And they are more excitable, meaning they have a lower resting membrane potential and can depolarize quickly in response to small voltage changes. Thanks to these features, the conduction system is able to generate, conduct, and coordinate electrical impulses efficiently, making sure the heart beats in a synchronized and rhythmic way. Now let's look at how this conduction system works inside the heart itself. As I mentioned before, this system includes two main nodes located in the right atrium. These are connected by internodal pathways, special fibers that carry the electrical impulse from one node to the other. But that's not enough. The impulse also needs to be spread throughout both atria. To do this, the heart has additional atrial fibers that help distribute the impulse across the atrial muscle tissue. So far, the impulse has successfully reached all parts of the atria, but now it needs to move on to the ventricles. Interestingly, there is a brief delay before the impulse reaches the ventricles. Why is that? The reason is simple. This delay gives the atria time to completely contract and push blood into the ventricles before the ventricles begin their own contraction. This delay happens at the atrioventricular node, the second main node in the conduction system. The delay occurs because this node has fewer gap junctions, meaning the impulse travels more slowly through it. After passing through the AV node, the impulse enters the interventricular septum, where it splits into two major branches, the right bundle branch, RBB, and the left bundle branch, LBB, which carry the impulse to the right and left ventricles, respectively. 
But where did this electrical impulse originally come from? Everything starts at the sinoatrial node, SA node, located just below the opening of the superior vena cava. This node has the special ability to generate impulses automatically without any external stimulation. That's why it's called the natural pacemaker of the heart. But what gives it this pacemaking ability? Here we need to look at another key difference between cardiac muscle cells and skeletal or smooth muscle. Cardiac cells, especially those in the SA node, have a lower resting membrane potential and are more excitable. This means they can depolarize spontaneously, even without direct input from the nervous system. This automatic activity is strongest in the SA node, which is why the entire heart follows its rhythm. Now it's time to look at all of these events from an electrical perspective through the ECG. The first wave you'll notice on the ECG is the P wave. This wave represents atrial depolarization, which means the electrical impulse is spreading across the atria, starting from the sinoatrial node, SA node, and reaching the entire atrial muscle. This is what triggers the atria to contract and push blood into the ventricles. The next part is a group of waves called the QRS complex. This complex represents ventricular depolarization, the impulse that causes the ventricles to contract. It starts from the atrioventricular node, AV node, and travels through the interventricular septum, spreading through the ventricles. The structure and orientation of the conduction fibers cause the electrical impulse to travel from the bottom of the ventricles upward. This upward direction ensures that blood is effectively pushed out of the ventricles and into the arteries. After that, we see the T wave. Unlike the previous waves, the T wave represents repolarization, the electrical reset phase. This is when the ventricles return to their resting state, allowing them to prepare for the next heartbeat. One unique feature of cardiac muscle is that it actually requires an active repolarization signal to stop contracting. In contrast, skeletal and smooth muscles simply relax when the contraction signal stops but cardiac muscle stays contracted until it receives a repolarization signal. You might wonder, where is the wave for atrial repolarization? Well, it's there, but we can't see it clearly because it happens at the same time as the QRS complex, which is much larger and hides the atrial repolarization wave. Oh, and one last thing. Sometimes we may also see a small U wave after the T wave. For now, we won't focus on that. We'll come back to it in a future video. Now that we've covered the basic ECG waves, it's time to go a little deeper into the details. Every ECG trace is centered around a baseline called the isoelectric line. This line represents the zero electrical activity level. Any wave above this line is considered positive and any wave below it is considered negative. This is clinically important because in some heart conditions, the polarity of waves can change and that can be an important diagnostic clue. But what determines whether a wave appears positive or negative? To understand this, we need to talk about leads, something I'll fully explain in the next video. But for now, just keep this in mind. If the direction of the electrical impulse is toward a lead, it appears as a positive wave. If the impulse is moving away from a lead, the wave will be negative. Now, before we move on, I want to point out something important. Unlike the P and T waves, the QRS complex isn't a single wave. It's actually made up of three separate deflections, the Q wave, R wave, and S wave. The Q wave is the first negative deflection of the complex. It represents the beginning of ventricular depolarization, specifically the depolarization of the interventricular septum. The Q wave is especially important because in some leads, it's normally not present and its appearance can indicate conditions like myocardial infarction. The R wave is the first positive deflection and it reflects depolarization of the main mass of the ventricles. The S wave is the first negative deflection after the R wave and it usually corresponds to the final part of ventricular depolarization, especially in the upper parts of the ventricles. So when we read an ECG, we need to pay close attention not only to the shape of the QRS complex, but also to whether each wave appears where it should or shouldn't. Now let's take a closer look at the ECG paper itself. 
The ECG paper is made of small and large squares, and these squares are what we use to measure both time and voltage. Let me explain. Each large square is made up of five small squares. The horizontal axis represents time, and the vertical axis represents voltage, which shows the electrical strength of the heart's impulses. Each small square is one millimeter wide and one millimeter tall. So each large square is five millimeters by five millimeters. Now here's something important. The standard paper speed of an ECG machine is 25 millimeters per second. That means in one second, the ECG paper moves forward by five large squares or 25 small squares. So if we divide one second by 25 squares, we find that each small square equal 0 0.044 seconds and each large square equal 0 0.20 seconds. These time intervals are critical in ECG interpretation because any abnormal spacing between the waves may indicate a cardiac condition like heart blocks, arrhythmias, or electrolyte imbalances. Before we talk about the normal values of ECG intervals, let's first learn the key terms and differences between them. You already know the main ECG waves, P, QRS, and T. Now let's start with the PR interval. This is the time from the start of the P wave to the start of the R wave. You may have also heard the term PR segment, but clinically, the PR interval is much more important. Here's the difference. An interval includes both waves and flat lines, but a segment only includes the flat part with no waves in it. So for example, the PR interval which includes the P wave plus PR segment. The PR segment equals only the flat line between the end of P and start of QRS. Next, we have the QT interval, which goes from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. This interval tells us how long ventricular depolarization and repolarization take. Another important measurement is the QRS duration. This is the time from the start of the Q wave to the, to the end of the S wave. It shows us how long it takes for the ventricles to depolarize. The end of the QRS complex, right where the S wave ends and the ST segment begins, is called the J point. Now, how do we actually measure these intervals? It's simple. Just count the number of small squares within each interval and then multiply by 0 0.04 seconds. Because as we learned before, each small square equals 0 0.04 seconds. But to know whether a value is normal or abnormal, we need to memorize the normal ranges for these intervals. And we'll talk about that in the next part of the video. Let's now go over the normal ranges for each wave and interval on the ECG. These numbers are extremely important. Even a small change can be a sign of a serious cardiac problem. First, the P wave. The width and height of the P wave should both be less than 2.5 small squares. In terms of time, the duration should not exceed 0.10 seconds. If it's wider or taller than that, we might suspect atrial enlargement. Next, the QRS duration. This tells us how long it takes for the ventricles to depolarize. It should be between 2.5 to 3 small squares or 0.10 to 0.12 seconds. A wider QRS could indicate bundle branch blocks or ventricular rhythms. Then comes the QT interval. Normally, it should be between 9 to 11 small squares, which means it should be less than 0.44 seconds in total. A prolonged QT interval can lead to dangerous arrhythmias like torsades de points. And finally, the PR interval. It should last between 3 to 5 small squares, which equals 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. If it's longer than 0.20 seconds, that may suggest a first-degree AV block. So remember, these values are not just numbers, they are powerful diagnostic tools, and small deviations may point to significant cardiac conditions. All right, I hope this video helped you understand the basics of ECG and made things a little clearer. We've laid a strong foundation today, and in the next video, we'll finish the essential concepts so you can confidently read any ECG strip on your own. If you found this content helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Your support means a lot and helps me keep creating high quality medical content for all of you passionate learners out there. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to check out the next episode.
I'll see you there.